Hi, this is Kevin Stroud from the History of English podcast, where we explore the English language through the lens of history. You're listening to the history of Byzantium, an empire older than the English language itself. So sit back and enjoy as Robin takes you through the history of one of the world's great empires. And if you enjoy Robin's words and want to find out where they came from, check out the History of English podcast. So now, here's the history of Byzantium. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium. Episode 98, Leo the Armenian. During June 813, while Michael Ragave led the army to its sad defeat at Versinicia, there was a unique demonstration taking place back in Constantinople. The year before, a group of soldiers from the Tachmata had attempted to free the sons of Constantine V. Disturbed by Michael's lack of military skill and the looming threat of Crum's Bulgars, these men wanted change. Though this plot was treason, most of the conspirators had simply been sacked and now hung around the streets of the capital, grumbling bitterly. The second largest church in Constantinople was the Church of the Holy Apostles. It's the one which St. Mark's in Venice is based on. It was also the church which housed the imperial mausoleum. The disgruntled soldiers had contacts at the church who rigged the door connecting the resting place of emperors with the main body of the building. One day that summer, during a service, the doors flew open as if by magic, making a loud noise which drew everyone's attention. The soldiers sprang from their pew and ran to the tomb of Constantine V. They cried out to the dead Vasilefs to arise and save the empire. Though they were soon arrested and punished, the men spread the word that the son of Leo III had been seen, rising, mounting his spectral steed and galloping north toward Thrace. As I mentioned in the precap of this century, for some in 800, Constantine was akin to JFK, this legendary leader who'd beaten the Arabs and Bulgars repeatedly. His legacy was complicated by iconoclasm and the dung which men like Nicephorus and Theophanes had attached to his name, but for the men of the Tachmata, the units he'd founded, and for many common people, his star still shone bright. When Michael returned in shame later that summer, the troops were unanimous in their desire for a new leader, one of their own, who would put things right and bring victory again. That man was Leo V, and he too had Constantine on his mind. Leo was born in Armenia around 775, the year Constantine V died. His family was a noble one, so as a boy he would have been educated well and taught to lead. But in 788, he was amongst the reported 50,000 Armenians who fled the persecution of their Arab overlords and sought settlement within Byzantium. His father was enrolled in the Anatolikon, and his son followed. Leo is described as being short but powerfully built, with a big beard, curly hair, and a loud voice. His self-confident manner saw him advance through the ranks, and caught the eye of Vardan Turkus, the Stratigos whose troops proclaimed him emperor soon after Nicephorus had overthrown Irene. Fellow Armenian Vardan may have known of Leo's family, and clearly liked the young man a lot, as he married his daughter Barca to him, and made him one of his bodyguards. None of this favour, though, stopped Leo from abandoning his patron, as their uprising began to stall in the summer of 803. As Vardan was taken to his monastery, Leo was given a mansion in Constantinople, and promoted. By 811, he was Stratigos of the Armenia Khan. 
We don't know if the Armenian and his men were going to be called up for the attack on Pliska, but events intervened to make sure they would not be. As you know, the caliphate had descended into civil war at this point. That's what allowed Nicephorus to turn his attention to the Bulgars. But that didn't mean that Arab garrisons had disappeared. On the contrary, a sharp border commander made a very early spring raid on F. Ha'ita, the headquarters of the Armenia Khan, which looks like Yukata in English on the map. Leo was caught with his guard down. His troops were clearly not expecting a raid, instantly routed, and the city was stormed. Shaking his head back in Constantinople, Nicephorus ordered Leo to be flogged and sacked. Of course, this exile didn't last long, as the new emperor Michael recalled Leo and made him Stratigos of the Anatolikon, where, as you may remember, Leo smashed a small raid soon after, partially restoring his reputation. Leo and Michael seem to have got on well. One source implies that Michael stood as godfather to Leo's son Symbatius. Of course, this didn't stop Leo from abandoning a second patron and deposing him as emperor. The question of whether Leo actually betrayed Michael on the field of Versinicia remains unanswered. It certainly seems plausible that the troops fled on their own, but the career of Leo makes you wonder. A man of versatile talents and flexible principles, in the words of Warren Treadgold. Given the state Byzantium was in, in 813, perhaps he was the right man for his time. Once Michael and his family were safely on a boat, and Leo had been crowned, there was no more time to waste. The troops from Versinicia were moved into the capital, as Crum came marching south to take a good look at the Theodosian land walls. The Khan's brother remained at Adrianople, attempting to starve out the city, while Crum brought his main force to the capital. If the Bulgars had ever wondered if maybe the walls of the famous city weren't quite as impressive as men said, then, oh, no, they were right. They, they are that impressive. The Khan wanted to drive home his advantage and get the best peace deal he possibly could, while in the city, Leo's priority was not to lose. His regime was days old. The soldiers were with him, but he knew they were not up to tackling the Bulgars, Anytime soon. This stalemate led Crum to try and gain maximum propaganda value from his unharassed position. So he had his army dig a trench as if they were going to besiege the capital. He had them parade up and down the walls. He performed pagan rituals in view of the defenders. He had his harem come out to sing his praises. Once he'd run out of tricks, though, and with the Romans refusing to react to any of these provocative displays, he sent an offer of peace into the city. He said he would leave if Leo paid him a tribute of gold, robes, and maidens. The new emperor, living up to his crafty reputation, asked the Khan to meet him in person to discuss terms. The meeting spot was to be near the Vlachernai Gate, the northernmost part of the walls. Crum would come with three unarmed companions, and Leo would take a small boat to the same spot with three of his own. But of course, just like in the movies, one side was lying. Leo hid some other men nearby and prepared to kill the Khan when they met. Accompanying the emperor was one of the Tachmatic commanders, John Hexabulius. As the boat hit the shore, John removed his helmet, which was the signal for the attack. But apparently in Bulgar custom, the removing of one's hat was a sign of disrespect. So the Khan, suspecting something was up, got on his horse, and sure enough, armed men then appeared, shooting arrows at him and killing one of his companions. The Khan escaped, furious at the Emperor's treachery, with Leo claiming that one of the arrows had struck Crum as he fled. 
no historian I've read says that this story is fake, but it strikes me as suspicious. I don't see why either Crumb or Leo would risk meeting the other in person, though I suppose the precedent would be the attempted kidnap of Heraclius by the Avar Kargan. But then Heraclius had a real incentive to meet face to face. He wanted to become friends and allies. Surely Leo and Crumb had no reason to trust one another. Even if they did meet, I suspect the details of the attack are exaggerated, but who knows? Knowing for sure now that no peace would be forthcoming, Crumb ordered his men to methodically sack the capital's European suburbs. Churches and monasteries were targeted, the palace of St. Mamus was ripped to shreds, animals and people were slaughtered or carried off into slavery. This hit the capital's elites hard, as their holiday homes were thoroughly ravaged over the next couple of weeks, and the emperor insisting that his soldiers stay put. After destroying every town they could on the northern shore of the Sea of Marmara, Crumb's men made their way slowly north to Adrianople. On the way, they continued ransacking settlements. Only a few towns like Heraclea had strong enough walls to resist. This was a monumental raid. Thousands of captives were led north and their farms burnt. By mid-August, the full Bulgar horde had surrounded Adrianople. The city's population had swollen with refugees and they were running out of food. Crumb began bombarding the city with his siege engines. He didn't breach the walls, but he did break the defenders' nerve. Keen to save lives, and with no relief on the way, they surrendered. The Bulgars rounded up all those healthy enough to travel and marched them home with them. They were eventually settled north of the Danube in a new town which the Khan named Macedonia. Adrianople was the HQ of the theme of Macedonia. As horrified as the Romans were at this scarring assault, Leo remained firmly in power. We should remember that he was most popular with his Anatolian troops. He wasn't yet sure of the loyalty of the Tachmata, and especially not of the administration. So it served his military and political purposes to keep his soldiers by his side, not risk them in battle, and face down any potential opposition in the city. By the way, with the end of the siege of Adrianople, Theophanes' chronicle cuts out for good. We'll say a proper goodbye next week. Inside the city, Leo had been busy reorganising the administration and his household. Obviously, staunch allies of Michael had to be moved aside. So Theoctistus retired to become a monk, and Stephen left the Thachmata. Fellow Armenian Manuel replaced Leo as commander of the Anatolikon, and second in command of the border theme would be Thomas the Slav, who we'll talk a lot more about later. Uh, but you may remember him as one of the three men prophesied to have imperial careers alongside Leo and Michael of Amorian. Speaking of whom... Michael became commander of the Excubitors, the second highest Tachmatic post in the capital. Michael and Leo had both abandoned Vardan Turkus and been rewarded by Nicephorus. And Michael had encouraged Leo to become emperor when they were out in Thrace. However, it seems that the two men fell out as soon as they entered the city. Both men had married daughters of Vardan, and obviously the sisters were close. But though Michael loved his wife dearly, Leo seems to have felt differently. It's all rumour and speculation, but it seems like Leo's wife Barker was unsuitable to be empress. It's possible she'd been caught in a notorious bit of adultery or something like that. We don't know for sure but it seems like Leo was able to divorce her before becoming emperor and that no one objected strongly, except for Barker herself and, by extension, her sister and Michael. We don't know to what extent this ill-feeling lingered. 
Michael served in the capital with no apparent difficulty, and Leo stood as godfather to Michael's son, Theophilus. But this potential grudge seems more significant when I tell you that in seven years' time, Michael will depose Leo. Leo chose a new bride, Theodosia, a fellow Armenian who was the daughter of Arseba, a well-respected patrician. Uh, Well-respected by some, anyway. Arseba was the man who'd been put up to be emperor in a palace coup against Nicephorus the decade before. This may well have influenced Leo's choice. He, like Michael before him, was keen to distance himself as much as possible from the policies of Nicephorus. The defeat at Pliska was such a shock that it had aroused a sentiment which had lain dormant for the past 20 years. Maybe God really was angry about the icons. The issue of the icons was both political and religious. The memory of Constantine V was irrevocably tied up with iconoclasm, and the nostalgia for his time, when we all felt safe and when God protected our armies, was at its height. The capital soldiers were agitating for change, and some of the clergy were thinking along the same lines. Into this mood stepped Leo, a brand new emperor looking to establish his legitimacy. A return to iconoclasm offered him the chance to make a complete break with the past, to marshal the memory of the Isaurians and connect it to his own dynasty. If he coupled this new outlook with military victory, he would have managed to cement himself as the rightful ruler who'd restored God's favour to his chosen people. We don't know how Leo felt personally about the issue. It's easy to lump in his iconoclasm with his reputation for deviousness and assume that he cynically manipulated the situation. But he was from the Anatolikon, where iconoclasm had roots, and he may have come to genuinely believe in what he was doing. He didn't rush things. He took gradual steps towards his goal. At Christmas that year, he crowned his son Symbatius as co-emperor. For the occasion, he had his son renamed to Constantine. The assembled troops could then cheerily acclaim Leo and Constantine as emperors. The symbolism was obvious. A new Leo, a new Constantine, were here to defeat the Bulgars but educated men knew there were other potential takeaways from such a pronouncement. The next year, 814, saw Crum lead his army back into Thrace to raid the parts he'd missed the last time. The sources are unclear as to whether Leo did anything during the campaign season. Certainly, he wasn't going to commit his forces to taking on the Khan directly. Crum was becoming frustrated, No matter how much damage he did to Thrace, there was nothing he could do to force the Byzantines to agree peace. So he decided to up the ante and besiege Constantinople, for real. Without a navy, Crumb's chances of succeeding were slim, and presumably he knew this. Perhaps he was just hoping that this embarrassment would force Leo back to the negotiating table. His preparations were real enough, as spies warned the emperor what was going on, and the Armenian leapt into action. He ordered a new wall to be built at the Vlachernai end of the city. They were the most vulnerable spot because they were a new construction, not part of the Theodosian triple walls. He also dispatched an embassy to Charlemagne to ask the emperor to invade Bulgar territory from the west. But by the time the ambassadors reached Aachen, both Charles and Crum were dead. The Khan was overseeing his preparations in April when he suddenly had a cerebral hemorrhage. Blood flowed from his nose, mouth and ears, and he was gone. Initially, his brother seems to have taken charge. Then he died. It was a while before Crum's son Omatag was fully in control. This destabilizing change of leadership took all the momentum out of their plans, 
and the Bulgars didn't campaign that summer. At great cost to the people of Thrace, Leo had seen out the storm and could plan a way forward. The emperor hoped that he could restore some form of iconoclasm without causing great ructions in the capital. So initially he turned to a small group of clergy to draw up a dossier of arguments against the veneration of images. The most famous of these clergymen was John the Grammarian, though at this stage he was just another abbot. The emperor shared their initial findings with the patriarch Nicephorus, who, as you might expect, looked disdainfully on their conclusions. Leo smoothed things over, but then added more clergymen to his commission and asked them to come up with something more substantial. By Christmas 815, they had. By then, they'd found the conclusions of Constantine V's Council of 754 and were able to assure Leo that they had the clinching arguments ready to go. This time, when Leo and Nicephorus met, the emperor told the patriarch that his soldiers were demanding something be done, that they saw the icons as responsible for their defeats. He was proposing a compromise. He only wanted to remove icons that were placed at ground level. These icons were receiving worship which should rightly go to God. He wasn't going to ban the icons, he wasn't going to deface churches, he just wanted to remove this clearly problematic placement. Nicephorus would not compromise, though. Icon veneration was established by church tradition. Leo said he understood, but that his commission had found writings by the church fathers which seemed to contradict this tradition. He invited the patriarch to discuss it with them. Knowing a trap when he saw one, though, Nicephorus was firm. The matter had been settled by an ecumenical council. To debate it would be inappropriate in itself. With the patriarch digging his heels in, another incident took place which indicated the direction of events. A group of Tachmatic troops began getting rowdy outside the Chalk Gate. They directed abuse at the icon of Christ which Irene had placed there, and when they began pelting it with rocks and garbage, Leo ordered other troops in to calm them down and remove the icon for its own protection. This vignette sounds about as manufactured as possible. You may recall that there's considerable debate about whether there even was an icon on the gate when Leo III supposedly removed it, and Irene showily restored it after the 787 council. So whether our Leo staged the disquiet to remove the icon, or if the troops forced his hand, or if the whole thing is a fantasy, the one thing that seems clear is that the emperor was making it known which way the wind was blowing. If you were smart, it was time to start agreeing that low-hanging icons should be removed. Nicephorus sent out word to any loyal iconophile clergy in the vicinity and gathered them together on Christmas Eve. Front and centre was Theodore of Studion. Any tension between him and the patriarch forgotten in their mutual desire to resist the emperor's plans. I realise now that I spent last episode calling him Theophilus, which was a very stupid thing. I am reading about the future Emperor Theophilus at the moment, but my sincere apologies to all of you and to Theodore, who I can assure you would not have been amused. The next day there was a tense confrontation before the Christmas service at the Hagia Sophia. Again, Leo asked Nicephorus and his followers to at least meet with his commission, but they pointed out that the commissioners were all staying in the palace. They were imperially sponsored. It would not be a fair discussion. And Theodore bluntly told the emperor to leave church matters to the clergy. The emperor cooled the situation, though. He brought out a small icon that he wore around his neck, kissed it in front of the angry prelates, and then led them into the church where he venerated an altar cloth with a nativity scene on it. Once they'd reached the new year, though, Leo started to play hardball. Next week, 
the emperor will force through the return of iconoclasm and seal it in Bulgar blood. Before I go, though, I'd like to recommend you check out the History of English podcast by Kevin Stroud. As the title suggests, Kevin takes you through the journey of the English language and how it developed into what it is today. It's an incredibly researched project and you'll learn all sorts of fascinating things, like how Jesus' crucifixion has led us to feel excruciating pain at the crucial moment. And if you're in the mood to be persuaded, I suggest you check out episode 55, where Kevin talks about the expression, I could care less. Being English myself, my snobby nostrils raised when I first heard this apparently American reduction of a sentence into something that contradicts itself. But on the podcast, you'll learn that the history of the English language is filled with contractions and reductions, and that I could care less is a fairly natural simplification of couldn't. See if it persuades you by going to historyofenglishpodcast.com or checking it out on iTunes. 